On behalf of Richard and Angie and the whole family, who I'm acquainting myself with uh, this afternoon, a very, very warm welcome to you all here at the Millmead Centre, or should I call it the new Millmead Centre? It might be a disorientating experience for some of you uh, to be in this building. And also a welcome to all of you, I have no idea how many, thousands are joining us on this wonderful facility of live stream so that you can be part of this Thanksgiving memorial service today. As you know, when David passed away last year, on Ascension Day, as a matter of fact, um, a day that was very important in David's uh, theological vision. Um, at that time, it was simply impossible to do anything by way of a thanksgiving. And indeed, the longer that time went on, it, it, it felt, didn't it? It felt that maybe the moment had gone to be able to do something to honor, honor David. And then, of course, with Enid's departure so recently and the opening up of the country, uh, thanks be to God, we all agreed, the family agreed, not only was it possible, but also fitting, really fitting, that we host a memorial service here at the Millmead Center for David and Enid Pawson together. And as we shared that, a lot of, there's a lot of nodding of heads and agreement saying that would be a good thing to do. So that's why we're here today to, to celebrate and to give thanks for this wonderful couple uh, to be in this place, albeit slightly changed, where they spent uh, so many fruitful years, and, um, and above all, to give thanks to God for, for them and for the ongoing ministry and power of the gospel. In a moment in the service, I'm going to hand over to Angie, who's going to bring tribute to her dad and to her mum. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Already. <laughs> Before she does that, we're going to begin our service today, where we must surely begin with a hymn of praise. So if you are able, can I invite you to stand as we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
you'd like to remain standing and lead us in an opening prayer. Gracious Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus, we thank you that we can gather today. We have all lived long enough to be able to sing every line of that hymn with conviction and with gratitude. Your mercies are indeed new every morning. And were this not so, we confess that we would be utterly lost. As we come today to give thanks for David and for Enid, we give thanks for your faithfulness that comes to us supremely in the grace of our Lord Jesus. May we know your presence to cheer and to guide. May you give us strength for today. We especially pray for the family gathered today on this special day. And above all, may you fill us with hope so that all of us on this day might be able to say with more faith than perhaps we've ever known, death, where is your victory? Where is your sting? Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We give you thanks and we ask for the presence and the power of your spirit to be among us in this service and throughout the rest of this day. Amen. 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 Would you like to take your seats? And again, a very warm welcome to you if you just joined. It's so good to see so many faces. Many I don't know, but some I do know, of course. And I'm going to hand over now to Angie to pay tribute to your mum, <laughs> to your dear mum, who I knew and loved very much. So, Angie, would you like to come and, and share some reflections? Mum. Mum and tea went hand in hand. You will all know this, but there was always a cup of tea very close when you were with mum. This was my first huge lesson from her, everyone is welcome. The door to the manse was always open and everyone walked through it was offered a cup of tea and something to eat. She taught me to cook and bake. Every Saturday we baked for the Sunday afternoon tea with visitors. I remember one Sunday I had been on the back of a motorbike with millimetres, there may be some of you here today, and we'd been on a ride up Box Hill as usual. As we pulled into the drive, Mum came out and invited all the bikers in their leathers and big boots in for tea and cake. She was extraordinarily hospitable. Every Sunday we had several visitors join us for Sunday lunch and she loved cooking and providing for all of them. The spare room was often, often occupied by someone who needed help and Mum and Dad provided that safe and welcoming haven. Her manners were impeccable. She taught us to be polite. Pleases and thank yous were very important to her throughout her life. From her hospital bed two months ago, she said to me, I would quite like to go to heaven tonight. Would you mind? <laughs> <laughs> so many words describe mum's character. Grace, dignity, loyalty, faithful, humble, generous, understated, patient, fair, poised, loyal, caring, and practical. The most important was Christian. Her faith was so strong and was the most important thing to her and dominated everything she did. She was not perfect. She had a mischievous side. Two years ago, she was helping me host a Macmillan coffee morning and I asked her to cut the cake. A few moments later, she said how delicious it was, and I couldn't see a piece missing. But she showed me how to take a slither out and move the pieces to make it look complete. <laughs> that was about as naughty as she would get. She encouraged our independence, so much so that she told all three of us frequently through our teams that once we were earning money, we were out. Sure enough, I got my first job in London at 18, and within two weeks, Mum and Dad had driven me up to my Shepherd's Bush flat with a teapot, cups, and cake, 
as you would expect, all you need in preparation to live in the big city. Once the three of us had left home, she then dedicated herself totally to Dad's welfare and ministry and supported him impeccably for 40 years. She travelled with him well into her 80s and did everything in the background in order for him to fulfil his ministry. Her devotion to Dad and his work was without compromise and she never wanted the limelight. She was delighted when grandchildren arrived, first Rebecca, then Guy, Aruna, Evie and Dan. She would bake for just about every one of their birthdays and loved playing with them, particularly board games. She was never happier than when all the grandchildren were together over tea or when all the families gathered for our traditional pantomime and meal at Christmas time. As well as the best of times as mother and grandmother, she also experienced the worst. When Deborah was diagnosed with leukemia and died a month later, aged 36. This was devastating for all of us. But mum held her head high and dealt with it in a very quiet way. I don't think she ever recovered from the loss. I can't imagine what she went through, but you never saw the suffering. My daughter, Evie, was born two weeks after Deborah passed away, and we named her Evangeline, as she certainly brought good news to all of us. And of course we have Rebecca, who's been very much part of the family. Mum was blessed with good health all her life and was only in hospital once, a visiting eye specialist who happened to be having Sunday lunch with us looked at the red mark in her eye, which she'd had as long as I could remember, and recommended she had it checked out. It was a malignant growth, and she was whisked off to East Grinstead and had an extraordinary eye graft operation that saved her life and her sight. I remember the eye surgeon saying that mum was the most peaceful, content face he'd seen when under anaesthetic. She was always well turned out. She made a lot of her own clothes while we were growing up. She loved putting outfits together. She made all Deborah and my Sunday dresses when we were young. When I started my first job as a junior secretary at Shell in London, she made a whole wardrobe of pencil skirts and fitted blouses which she thought was appropriate. <laughs> she was so pleased to get me out of jeans and leather jackets. A talented seamstress, skills which she passed on patiently to Deborah and I and her granddaughters, Evie, Aruna and Rebecca. Also knitting, she knitted at every opportunity and passed this passion on to the younger generation. Another passion for mum was flowers and she particularly loved the autumn tree colours. She would have loved the beautiful colours in the arrangement here today, so thank you Sally. I would also like to say a huge thank you to Ian and the whole Milmead team for being so helpful with today's event. Mum and Dad met over tea. Dad was the visiting minister at my grandma's church in Gunness, North Lincolnshire, and Mum, aged 28, was visiting her mum that weekend. So Grandma invited Dad to tea before the Sunday evening service and wheeled out her remaining single daughter. <laughs> like Mrs. Bennett from Pride and Prejudice. <laughs> the rest is history. They courted and within weeks Dad had proposed and they married months later in October 1956. Mum always loved children. She would have loved to have been a teacher but left school before getting any qualification. So she worked as a doctor's secretary with a travelling chest x-ray unit but actually she really wanted to be a mum. Dad whisked her off to Aden soon after they married as he was chaplain in the RAF and within a year Deborah was born there. Richard followed once they were back in the UK and I came last, the baby of the family. Dad told me from a young age that he thought it was quite risky calling me an angel. Perhaps I didn't completely fulfil their expectations. <laughs> so mum had three children under four which I'm sure was a handful. She taught us to play independently, a love of board games, and from a young age, I really wanted to be a mother, influenced, I'm sure, by her enthusiasm for it. I'm now a mother myself, with Evie and Dan, and she was right, it is the best thing. She was born Enid Pepperdine, 
in 1928 in Caister, Lincolnshire. She had an older brother, Ernest, and two older sisters, Eileen and Kathleen. She was brought up in a Methodist home, and her mother, Edith Pepperdine, was a lovely, hospitable lady. There's one Pepperdine here today, representing the large Pepperdine clan. My cousin Maggie, thank you for coming. Mum was brought up frugally, and through our childhood, that showed, writing down every single penny she spent. She would make sure we had everything we needed before she spent anything on herself. She never complained, she just got on with it. Mum was two years younger than the Queen, and she had great respect for all the work she did. She was so delighted to receive her card from the Queen for Mum and Dad's Ruby wedding anniversary. On Mum's 80th birthday, the whole family took her to the pump rooms in Bath to celebrate. We had requested the quartet to play Happy Birthday, but as they started, we had to point out to Mum that it was in fact in her honour. She then promptly stood up and did the royal wave. <laughs> <laughs> to me, she was somewhere between the Queen and Mary Berry. Tributes have come in from all over the world to Mum and Dad as a team. And I'd like to read one which sums Mum up. It came from Johnny, John and Angie Hindmarsh, who may be here. Thank you for this. Your mum was an incredible cheerleader for David in the quietest and most dignified way possible and the strongest defender of his time, energy and gifts. And she served both David and the Lord in an unrelenting, grace-filled and dignified way that set an incredible example for everyone else. She was one of those ladies that if you wanted to see authentic Christianity being lived out, you need go no further than meet Enid. What she said and what she did were one and the same thing. And with David, they somehow made one plus one equal ten. What a wonderful lady. I feel proud and privileged to have had her as my mum, but also to have shared her with so many others. I'd like to give Deborah the last word. In Mum's memory scrapbook, I found a handwritten poem written by Deborah, aged 18, as she was leaving home to go to King Alfred School in Winchester to do teacher training. And indeed, she became a very good teacher. She thanks Mum and Dad for everything they'd done for her, and I'd just like to read the last verse. So as I come to fly the nest, I've one more thing to say. And though it rhymes, I promise you, I mean it anyway. A father in the pulpit and a mother in the pew. Don't give me any other, I'd rather just you too. Angie, thank you so much. That was just beautiful and honouring. Thank you so much. This next hymn, actually, uh, is very pertinent to what you just shared. And the many challenges, I'm sure, I know that David and Enid passed through. And there is a, actually a backstory to this um, hymn that probably many of you know in terms of the actual hymn writer. But there's also a backstory to this hymn in terms of David and Enid. And if you want to read about it, I'm going to embarrass Richard now. He gave me this last year, Book of Reflections. And he's, he's rolling his eyes at me at the front here. You can't see. And uh, there's actually a chapter about the, uh, this particular hymn and when it was sung down in Bath. And uh, I'm going to leave uh, you to read this, read this story, or maybe afterwards we can just talk around it. Um, simply to say that we couldn't get the three tenors today to sing it, uh, nor Cliff. I don't think he's here. Uh, but we have a good congregation, so I'm going to encourage you to sing with the hymn writer, uh, Whatever my lot, whatever my lot, it is well with my soul. So would you like to stand and we'll 
sing this together. Thank you to Chris as well for joining us. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. That will mean a lot to the family. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Well, this is our prayer 
for this dear family and it feels like we're retrieving mum and dad from, from all the incredible things that they've done in their lives. And so I'm going to ask now Richard to bring tribute to, to dad. It's a strange feeling, but it's also an honor to be speaking to you from this very place where Dad preached more than a thousand sermons. But my very first concrete memory of hearing him speak, hearing him preach, wasn't here in Millmead. It was in the Albert Hall in the late 1960s at a very big Christian gathering, and my two sisters and I were seated with Mum behind the stage. And I remember him walking up to the lectern, and he said, hallelujah. And there was a kind of muted response. (laughs) Hallelujah, hallelujah, you know, rippled its way up through the galleries. And Dad said, I think we can do better than that. He said, when I drop my hand, I want you all to say hallelujah. And this great... (laughs) And this great roar went up as 6,000 people said, hallelujah. Dad said, thank you. He said, now I can say that I have conducted the Hallelujah Chorus at the Royal Albert Hall. It was an example of the more playful side of his preaching that he used sparingly, but sometimes to great effect. Another of my personal favorites is when he was preaching his way through the book of Acts, and he revealed that the 20th century figure, Emperor Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, was believed by some to be a direct descendant of the Ethiopian eunuch mentioned in Acts chapter (laughs) 8. That woman's rippling up through the galleries as well. Um, But what was the origin of this playful manner? Well, I set myself a challenge for today, which is to tell you five things that you didn't know about David Pawson. And the first is that when he was studying for his theology degree at Cambridge in the early 1950s, David Pawson was a member of the Cambridge Footlights. For those who don't know, regarded as the birthplace of much British comedy uh, acting and writing. But of course he was better known for the strongly analytical approach that he applied to his Bible teaching. And what was the origin of that? To what did he owe the analytical strengths that he had? Well, the answer is tobacco. Not as a consumer, dad was never uh, a, uh, a smoker, but because his family roots lay in the big tobacco business. Now, wait, you're saying, I'm sure that I heard David say that his family roots were in farming and preaching, right? Yes, but that was on his father's side. And he once told me that he thought he got his heart from his father, a very pastoral heart in both senses of the word, but that he got his mind from his mother. And his mother was a Sinclair from the Sinclair tobacco families, family very successful businessmen. After the war, when the companies consolidated, one of Dad's relatives, uh, John Sinclair, became uh, chairman of Imperial Tobacco, and his uncle, uh, John Alexander Sinclair, became chairman of the rival big big company, Carreras. And interestingly, Dad said that that uncle, Uncle Alec as he knew him, was a huge influence on Dad as a young man, not just on worldly matters, but on spiritual matters also. And in fact, that analytical strength goes even further back. Uh, Dad's first name was John. You might have heard that both those two I just mentioned were Johns. It was a tradition in the Sinclairs. And that went all the way back to Sir John Sinclair, first baronet, who was an 18th century economist. And he coined the word statistics into the English language. So that gives you quite an interesting heritage. Now, with all these analytical skills and with Dad's mastery of the English language, those given to classification would probably have called him a left-brained person. 
But dad was also surprisingly strong in skills that are associated with the right brain. In particular, his extraordinary spatial awareness. He could come to your home or to your church, and a month later, if you asked him, I saw this many times, he could draw accurate plans and elevations of the building. Extraordinary. He had a hand in the design of uh, many church buildings, a small one here, but he completely designed a church in Tamworth that he was very, very proud of. Um, and, uh, and he could draw well. We don't have very many examples of that, but there are a couple out along with other memorabilia for you to look at after the service. But I wonder how many of you remember that he had distinctive handwriting? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? It was... It was neither ornate nor ordinary. It it was neither baroque nor boring. I'm sorry, the alliteration thing is in the genes. Uh, (laughs) But I wonder how many of you know why his handwriting looked like that. Because in his 20s, David Pawson sat down and redesigned his handwriting overnight completely twice. It was an example of the almost preternatural self-control that he was capable of exhibiting in some areas of his life. There were exceptions. One of those relates to the F word. That went quiet. Fudge. Dad had a very sweet tooth. And he was very partial to fudge in particular. But like almost every other subject sacred or profane, David Pawson had very strong ideas about how fudge ought to be. And he used his itinerant Christian ministry to scour the country in search of the best fudge shops. When we were young in the 60s, his favorite was on Windsor High Street. And it wasn't until many years later that I realized that this was why every visiting speaker and family guest was taken to view Windsor Castle. Uh, by the end of the 70s, he'd switched allegiance to a fudge shop in Carmarthen, which was conveni- in Wales, which was conveniently en route to the uh, small family uh, holiday home that uh, my parents had in the Cardigan Bay, in which Dad had designed. And I remember one time that Dad was feeling very, very pleased with himself because he'd managed to procure from somewhere else an enormous Tupperware box you remember this, about this big and about this deep. And on the next visit to Wales, uh, he uh, went to Carmarthen and he kind of waltzed into the shop with this box and said in the manner that you would say to a petrol pump attendant in those days, can you fill it up, please? (laughs) And the woman behind the counter said, no! (laughs) Dad said, why not? And uh, she said, well, then there won't be enough for other customers. And Dad was really very put out about this, and uh, he, uh, that initiated another search, so that by the end of the 80s, he alighted on uh, a small family-run fudge shop in Devon called Rowley's, and do you know he remained faithful to Rowley's for the rest of his life? And uh, thanks, I think, in no small part to his uh, patronage, Rowley's is now a chain of 45 shops across the UK. <laughs> And every time I see one, I think there really ought to be one of those sort of blue and gold crests that says, purveyors of fudge by appointment to David Pawson. Now, my last uh, revelation is also something that Dad felt very strongly about, and that is David Pawson was adamant that he did not want a memorial service. Now, Mum didn't want one either, but in Mum's case, it was because she saw it as breaking the 11th commandment. You know, thou shalt not make a fuss. But why was Dad so against the idea? Well, partly he used to say he thought memorial services go on a bit. But that's a little bit rich, really, isn't it, coming from someone who (laughs) wasn't known for brevity. I can see my family in the corner of my eye thinking the apple hasn't fallen far from the tree there then. Uh, but um, he, uh, not that anyone complained in Dad's case. Someone might be here today, I don't know, said to me just a few weeks ago, 
I could listen to your father speaking for an hour and a half, and it felt like 10 minutes had passed. That's a great gift, isn't it? But there was a deeper reason. He didn't like the idea of not having any control over what was going to be said. Now, could David Pawson really have been concerned that people would say negative things about him at a memorial service? Let me tell you the truth. He was concerned about the opposite. He knew that a memorial service could turn into a hagiography, the name we give to a traditional life of a saint. And he knew that wasn't appropriate. Now let me be crystal clear because I don't want that remark to be misinterpreted. David Pawson led a moral and upright life. Thanks be to God. But what I am trying to tell you is that outside of his professional role, he was an ordinary person, a very ordinary person like you and I, filled with doubts and insecurities like an ordinary person is, capable of being hurt by others and just as capable of causing hurt to others. And this is just a plea, a heartfelt plea to say it's good that we honour him for his extraordinary gifts, his dedication and his effectiveness in the pulpit. It's not good to put him on a pedestal. And I'll say no more on that topic except to say that I believe that Dad wanted you to know this. Earlier this year, Angie and Mum and I returned to Dad's grave together to view the newly installed headstone. It carries a very simple inscription, his name, his dates, and the words chosen by Mum, well done, good and faithful servant. The stone itself is very simple. It's a slab of granite set directly into the earth. Not on a pedestal, mind. The faces of the granite have been smoothed to better carry the message, but not highly polished, still natural. And the edges of the stone have been left rough-hewn, I think if Dad had seen it, he would smile. One or two people have commented that the inscription seems a little odd visually because it's not centered vertically in the stone. It's all in the top half. But that's because the inscription is incomplete. We buried Mum there in the same plot a month ago. Incidentally, it's in a beautiful spot by a still water pond fed by the same spring that fed the pond at Stillwater's, their home that many of you would have visited. But we had to remove the headstone so that the earth can settle once again. But when it's returned next spring, the inscription will be complete. And mum and dad will have equal billing. We didn't want her squeezed in like a footnote. They weren't equal in their public ministry. They weren't equal in many other respects. But they were equal in their worth. In their worth to each other. In their worth to the family. And in their worth equal in the sight of Almighty God.
Richard, thank you so much. Very powerful and very honoring. We're actually going to continue in a, another tribute, um, a final tribute on this occasion. We've, Richard, Angie, we're very deliberate about this. We could spend, we could spend the rest of this day, people coming up, sharing tributes. Um, we have a, a, a meal afterwards, a reception for that to happen. I'm sure ongoingly there'll be lots of things that will be said uh, by way of honor. But today, uh, Steve, I'm going to invite you to come, Steve Valley, who heads up the David Pawson Teaching Trust, come to share now a bit about David's ongoing ministry. Thank you, Richard, and thank you, Angie. Let me start by saying it, it is a privilege today to participate with you, remembering the lives of two very special godly people, David and Enid, as we knew them. For those who are on the live stream, we're aware that there are people as far away as Mexico, uh, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Australia listening in, wishing also to pay their tributes. I've overseen David's ministry now since uh, 2009, and David would often affectionately refer to me as his manager. Um, I can assure you I was nothing more than his driver. <laughs> and many of you just know me as Steve. I discovered David Pawson's teachings back in 1982. On leaving university, I came to Guildford to take up my first teaching job as a master in the Royal Grammar School. And those um, who were members of the church here at Millmead at that time were very welcoming and would pass me the occasional tape saying, you might like to listen to this. Well, what I can say is that I remember more of David's teachings from those days than from what was actually said in the pulpit, because David had left well before I came to Millmead. And that's no disrespect to the minister at that time. It is just a respect to the impact that David's teachings have had on many of our lives. When um, David accepted the position and came to what was then the pastor of um, the Commercial Road Baptist Church, little did anybody know of how much this building and the members of Millmead would play in creating such a legacy of the future. David was a pastor of this church in the days before anyone had a home video recorder. But yet with a very simple cassette tape deck and the team here at Millmead, as Richard has already said, more than a thousand uh, recordings were made of David in this very auditorium. Um, it was a small team of members at Millmead as well that's helped David set up the David Pawson Teaching Trust some 15 years or more ago. And it's that trust today that's responsible for making sure that his teachings are available all around the world. It is therefore fitting that we are meeting here today in Millmead to pay our respects to David and Enid. Um, you've heard a lot about Enid, and, and I would have to add to that, it would be remiss of me not to, to mention Enid and the role that she played in David's ministry. They were very much a team. And I have to say, Enid, for me, was very much a role model of how to lead a Christian life, an amazing lady. In their latter years, Enid found it very difficult to make the long journeys, and she wasn't able to accompany David on uh, some of those last journeys. But she was always present. Whether she was there in person or not, David would refer to her as his conscience. And even if we were on the other side of the world, David's conscience traveled with him. When temptation was put before us, as it often was in the form of food, David would look at the food and then he'd look at me and he would say, I can hear my conscience. <laughs> to which he would of often pass at the most exotic of desserts, which I would often savor. Well, it would be impolite not to, wouldn't it? Mind you, there were times, we talked about David being an ordinary human being, there were t times he did yield to temptation, especially if we were passing a blue peckers. Barbecue spare ribs, ooh. I did promise not to give away any of his secrets, so I, I will pass on now more to his ministry. I left Guildford after a couple of years, um, but kept in touch with many of the people here. And on one particular occasion, I had a phone call 
from um, a member of Millmead saying, did I know any physiotherapists in the Reading area? David had just suffered a major stroke days before he was going to record the challenge of Islam. And I was asked if I knew any physiotherapists, which I did, and could I arrange for one of them to go and manipulate David's uh, face to try and get some movement back to help him with his speech. All I did was to pass along the, uh, the telephone number and made the arrangements, but I, I didn't get involved or contact David at that time. If we roll the clock forward now a few years to 2009, I had now left the teaching profession and was commuting into London every day. And I would always put a tape on in the car going in and a tape on coming back, um, especially the Unlocking the Bible series. But I just ended up with so many questions and not answers. And so I remember one particular journey that I made into London, and I kept saying to myself, who can I ask for answers to these questions? When I heard this little voice say, call David. And I remember the conversation I had with myself, as one does occasionally, and I said to myself, yes, but, but I don't know David. And, and anyway, um, he doesn't know me. And this little voice says, no, but you've got his telephone number. So... As one does, I plucked up the courage and I called him and I said, you don't know me, I'm a stranger, but I've got all these questions. And he said, carry on, ask me. Well, at the end of that conversation, I said to him, have you retired? Because you must be 80 years of age by now. And he said, no, I haven't retired. He said, in fact, he said, I'm speaking tomorrow night in Southend-on-Sea. Now, Southend-on-Sea is three hours away from where I lived. And the first thought was, three hours there, three hours back on a Sunday night, how much do I really want to go and listen to David Pawson speak? And so while I was contemplating how to let him down, that maybe not on this occasion, he said, um, if you're thinking of going, could you give me a lift? <laughs> and strangely enough, I started debating with him and querying him. I said, David, do you know where South End on Sea is? He said, I've been there once. I said, and you are going to Southend-on-Sea on a Sunday night and coming back home? And he said, no, actually, they've offered me a flat for the evening. He said, but if you were to drive, at least I'd get home to my own bed at 1.30 in the morning. I don't know why I said it to this day, but my answer was, David, if you want a lift to Southend-on-Sea, I will drive you. Well, that was my first meeting with David, which resulted in me helping him develop his ministry over the last 11 years. Um, when I first, first met David, he was already a well-known international speaker. He'd authored about 20 books. He had a vast library of 1,500 audio teachings and was well-known for his Unlocking the Bible series. But we realized and agreed that at 80 years of age, time could well be short. And there was an urgency to capture as much of his teachings as we could on high-definition video, whilst he was still alive and able to do so. That was the start of a journey. And David set the goal that he wanted his teachings to be available to as many as possible for the lowest possible cost, free if possible, and at all stages maintaining the highest possible quality. So that's the challenge. Make it available in the highest possible quality and give it away for free. Well, everything that I learned in business school was just thrown out the window. Just trust and the Lord will provide. And that is what has happened over the last, last 11 years. There were a number of key events that followed. In 2011, David had the chance to return to IHOP in Kansas City. And when we arrived, the guys there faithfully said to me, what can we do to help David's ministry? Do you know what? By the end of that week, David had a fully functioning website with all of his talks uploaded to it. It was in 2013 and 14, David had the opportunity to go to Singapore, and again, two very intense weeks, but we were able to record many, many more videos in high definition. And I've been asked to share with you what David's ministry represents today. Well, since 2009, those 20 books have grown to 91 English language titles, 128 if you include the foreign language translations, which are published by the David Pawson Teaching Trust, and that doesn't include overseas publishers who have their own translations of many of these books. Unlocking the Bible, probably one of HarperCollins' best-selling Christian books, has now been translated into 18 of the most common languages in the world. That .org website that was set up in 2011 
took 18 months before it reached the first million viewings. And David um, was, was quite an ordinary guy who didn't want to be, uh, have all of this sort of prominence and fame. Um, occasionally I would go to him and tell him how many viewings there'd been. And I was quite amazed how interested he became when we hit the first million, which took 18 months later. Well, now we're enjoying about 250,000 viewings each month, every month. And that website has seen 16.6 million viewings in the lifetime that it's been there. That doesn't include YouTube. In 2013, we set up David's YouTube channel. David's YouTube channel is now viewed 500,000 times every month. And to add to those figures of .org, it's mind-blowing. 17.9 million viewings all time. David's ministry started as a man standing in a pulpit. And it evolved with reels of quarter-inch audio tape with a tape recorder that was carried to people's homes, those who couldn't attend a Sunday service. With the invention of the, uh, the audio cassette tape, David's ministry started to travel internationally and later evolved into DVDs, CDs, MP3s. Today, David's pulpit is the internet and his recordings speak for him, with approaching one million viewings every month across many different internet platforms, across 210 different countries. Thanks to the tr translation work and overdub that has been done so well by a TV channel in Taiwan called Good TV, David is one of the best Western, speak, uh, Western Bible teachers in China. In fact, David is the only Western Bible teacher who apparently speaks fluent Chinese. <laughs> and he was very proud of that. In all keeping with David's goal that we would make all of his teachings uh, available to read, to listen, and to watch online for free. When speaking in this auditorium, David would often um, attract an audience of up to 1,000 people. Now, you can't sit 1,000 people in this auditorium. It would be standing room only, and people would sit on the, um, uh, the staircases, and there would be overflow as well. Today, more than uh, 25,000 people are watching David's videos every day. And you know what's amazing? We've talked about reel-to-reel -reel tapes, cassette tapes, DVDs, CDs, 70% of those who are watching David's uh, teachings today are watching on a mobile phone or a mobile tablet. That's how technology has evolved. David's pulpit truly has become the internet and the recordings speak for him. David was keen that we didn't build a very big organization consuming lots of costs and resources as many ministers do. And I've pur purposefully not mentioned any names today for the fear of leaving someone out. Let me say it would be wrong for me to take the credit for all of the success. There are many, many, many people supporting this ministry worldwide, including those who give donations, translators, and many hundreds of volunteers who all play their part in making this a success. So in closing, let me pay respects also to the family who are remembering their dear mother, father, grandmother and grandfather today. We owe so much to them for the sacrifices they made when their father, grandfather was in so much demand. We remember, in, we remember David and Enid today with deep affection and thank them for the memory, many memories they've given us all. To God be the glory. This ministry continues and will do for the generations to come. Thank you, Steve. Thank you very much. Shall we stand? And uh, again, a welcome to all, and a welcome, a hello to everyone who's joining us. As Steve has just reminded us, no idea how many thousands of people will be uh, joining us live stream today, but um, so glad you can be with us through this technology and uh, celebrating and honoring David and Enid on this special day. Let's sing together Amazing Grace.
time to take your seats. We're going to have our reading now from Luke chapter 24, read to us by Andy Kitter. On that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, Are you only a visitor to Jerusalem and do not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, How foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened. They recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those who were with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen, and he has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. Years ago, I was in West Wales on a retreat, and on my way back, to England, I was traveling through the town of Newcastle, Emlyn, the hometown of the great Welsh preacher, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And knowing that he was buried there, I stopped the car by the church and I asked a woman who was in the cemetery if she could point me in the right direction. Uh, Nothing here, said the woman. You might want to try the public cemetery. My mother, I'm half Welsh, by the way. (laughs) That was a poor Welsh accent. Sorry, Steve. So I did try the public cemetery, expecting to find, I don't know, a big memorial. And after about 20 minutes or 25 minutes of searching, not being able to find anything, finally I found this very simple grave to Martin Lloyd-Jones, preacher, and to his wife, Bethan, who had passed away about eight years after him. And an inscription... For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I recall it now on this occasion 
because it strikes me that this is what David and Enid wanted as well. David was the foremost, the foremost Bible teacher of his generation. Of that, there is no doubt. He had an astonishing gift. Even if you disagreed with him, you were mesmerized. (laughs) His ministry has touched thousands and thousands, millions of lives. And so we honor him today, just as we are honoring Enid for the many gifts that she brought as well, and also her unwavering support of David and his ministry. Uh, They were an outstanding couple. But I knew them well enough to know the last thing they wanted was a fuss. (laughs) Maybe that came more from mum, I don't know, but I think it was from both of them. Rather, they would want to be known as David and Enid Pawson, servants of God. David and Enid Pawson, husband and wife, father, mother, grandfather, grandmother, our brother and sister in Christ. And above all, and I think I can say this with great confidence today, I think David would want me to say this, sinners saved by the grace of God. In fact, I know, I know David will want me to say that. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, as soon as Richard asked me if I would do the honor, it is an honor, tremendous honor, of speaking on this occasion and leading this service, I straight away recalled the story. I wasn't going to bring it, and I'm looking at the time, so don't worry. This won't be too lengthy. <laughs> but I think I may have even heard David tell the story. So maybe that's why it came to mind straight away of the last great imperial funeral of Emperor Franz Joseph in 1916. It was a grand occasion, the military procession arriving at the crypt of the cathedral in Vienna. The military officer leading the cortege stood at the door of the crypt and he cried, as was the ritual on these occasions, open! The cardinal of Vienna, who was behind the door, replied, as was the custom of these occasions, who goes there? The leading officer responded, we bear the remains of his imperial and apostolic majesty, Franz Joseph I, by the grace of God, emperor of Austria, king of Hungary, defender of the faith, with the leading officer continuing to list all of the emperor's 37 titles. And the reply from the cardinal behind the door, we know him not. The leading officer knocked again on the great iron door. Once again, the cardinal replied from behind the door, who goes there? The officer spoke again, this time using a much abbreviated and less ostentatious title or titles, maybe ten for the deceased emperor, to which the cardinal replied again, we know him not. The officer gave a third knock. And once again, the cardinal from behind the door replies, who goes there? At which point, the officer's third and final reply came. Stripping the emperor of all titles, he simply said, We bear the body of Franz Joseph, our brother, a sinner like us all, at which point the doors swung open and in entered the coffin. David and Enid Pawson, sinners saved by the grace of God and loved by God and with the Lord now in glory, awaiting a resurrection body. David would want me to say that also. (laughs) And this brings me to the Emmaus passage because, um, 
You know, it is by grace we have been saved, not works, so that no man can boast. And then I was thinking to myself, so, so what passage do I bring on such an occasion? David would probably want us to read the whole Bible. And I don't think he had particular favorite passages. All scripture was equally true at all time for David. So I, you know, help me. Where, where do you go? So I chose this passage. And in the way that David would often frame a message, and Richard has already beaten me to the post, I'm going to give you five reasons why this is fitting. This Emmaus Road passage is fitting for this occasion. And then we're going to sing a closing hymn before I'm going to ask Philip to bring some prayers of thanksgiving. Number one, the two people walking from Jerusalem towards the little town of Emmaus were most likely, we think, husband and wife, according to tradition. Cleopas, for sure, and his wife, Mary. Two pilgrims, two disciples of Jesus of Nazareth, walking on the way. Second reason I chose this passage is because their delight, as this mysterious stranger opened up the scriptures to them, is something that would characterize David's ministry, uh, the ministry of the word that he exercised for many years. I doubt there's a person here today who has not known the experience as David taught from the law and the prophets and the gospels and the psalms and the letters who did not have that experience of their heart inwardly burning as the Lord came to them through the ministry of the word. The third reason I chose this passage may not be as readily appreciated by people as much as the point I've just made, which is namely the importance of the table. That the two pilgrims brought Jesus to, which then he very subtly and cleverly changed so that the guest became the host. And now he's breaking bread with them. And they're having communion and their eyes are being opened. And I don't think it was just because of their Methodist background. Although I think it probably contributed to it. But this was very important. And was very important, the table to the building up of the community here, both at Milmead and also at Gold Hill Baptist in, in Chapel and St. Peter. People often say, and I've heard this said many times, you know, it was one of the successes, as it were. I've heard this said many times, well, Milmead is a preaching center. And I can remember a conversation with David saying, no, 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 that's not true. And I can remember talking to Enid about this. No, no, that's not true. The genius of Milmead, and I'd like to think still today, it is a community. And it is based around the communion table. And, and it's based around the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the heart and the genius of what God built during those days here at Milmead. And without the cross for David, there is no Christianity. There's just civic religion, which David, as you know, loathed. The fourth reason I chose this passage is because the city to which they returned, these two pilgrims, to share the good news about Jesus, whom they've now seen, is, of course, the city of Jerusalem. And this city was very precious to David and to Enid and would form a significant part of David's theological vision, not least, well, actually, his love for Israel and our indebtedness to the Jews. Fifthly, lastly, and perhaps most important of all, the reason I chose this reading for this occasion is because the risen Jesus, who meets Cleopas 
and Mary on the road to Emmaus is the same risen Lord Jesus who meets us now by his spirit, through his word, in the communion, through the prayers, through the worship, through the fellowship, through us gathering together as his people, we encounter through these ordinary things that we do the power of the risen Christ. The same risen Jesus who reminds us today that death for the one who trusts in the Lord is not the end, but the beginning. Not the terminus, but the consummation. And who reminds us in our present sufferings, which are part of any journey of faith, like the Lord, our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us when the Lord returns. Now, whether we will be 33, I never quite got that bit. (laughs) In the new heaven and the new earth that is coming surely to this planet, as surely as this pulpit is here, he will come. What we will look like, what age, (laughs) I don't know. But whatever body it will be, the Bible is quite clear, it will be incorruptible and imperishable, and it will be glorious. And as the hymn writer says, uh, not only will we be home with the Lord, as we shall sing in a moment, but every knee will bow. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. As the hymn writer says, when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. And then shall I bow in humble adoration. And this last line is the one that David and Enid would want us to take away from today. And there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. I'm going to invite Philip Colonies to lead some prayers. I'm going to come and join you, actually, Philip, where you're seated. It's so great you're able to be here today. And Philip, of course, is very much present in the coming of the church from Commercial Road to here at Millmead. And uh, was very much alongside David and Enid during the time here. So I'm going to come over to you, Philip, and uh, ask you, let's remain seated, actually, and then, Philip, if you'd like to lead us in some prayers. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for leading David and Enid with their young family to our fellowship in 1968. We thank you for instilling into David the unwavering determination to delve for, find, retrieve, present and promulgate Bible truth and courageously to challenge error. We and multitude of others thank you for giving him the gift of superb communication skills, both orally and in writing, so that his preaching and teaching and presentational abilities, aided by advances in media technology, have achieved a global reach. David's prominent preaching and teaching gifts were not exercised at the expense of his other pastoral responsibilities. So, Lord, you blessed us by the development of the church structure, constitutional changes, the establishment of geographical areas in in and around Guildford, which were then led by lay elders, for neighbourhood pastors, pastoral visitors and house groups and their leaders. 
So progressive growth occurred in the sense of our being a fellowship, fellowship in community, and our faith and prayerfulness grew, particularly in meeting the massive challenge of praying this building into being. Mm. We praise you too for David's visionary gift concerning many architectural features of the Millmead Centre because as we've heard, he could have been an architect as well. Particularly we pray, thank you for the emphasis he placed on this place as being a place for people to meet as much as for meetings. We bless you Lord for the gift of Enid, for her unfailing support for David throughout all of his ministry at home and abroad in good times and bad times, without which David could not have achieved all that he did. Also for the, her own precious and loving prayer ministry and pastoral gifts, and for her close contacts with so many in our fellowship, all the while devotedly fostering the needs of Deborah, Richard and Angela in their formative years. So, Lord, David and Enid are no longer with us bodily, but we rejoice in our assurance that their spirits are now reunited together in your presence and that their faithful services for you jointly and individually are not at an end, but by the power of your Holy Spirit are yielding and will continue to yield a rich legacy of bringing souls into your kingdom for years to come. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Philip, for leading us in our prayers. And my apologies. I didn't have my order of service with me in the pulpit. <laughs> so, so we're going to gather those prayers up together and sing our closing hymn. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. Would you like to stand? Thank you. 
Hallelujah, Lord, yes, hallelujah. We thank you that we've been able to come today and pay tribute to David and to Enid. But above all, we thank you that we can come today to say these great words, my God, how great thou art. To you be all the glory and the power. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you like to take your seats? Thank you again to Richard and to Angie, and thank you to Steve for these really wonderful, powerful tributes. Thank you, Philip, for leading our prayers, and to Andy for the reading. Uh, we got some lovely surprises afterwards, and I'm not just talking about the food. I don't know about the fudge. That was new to me. Um, but we've got some lovely refreshments, uh, but also a little surprise that I think somewhere during the reception, Richard, you might just uh, st stand up or lead a guided tour outside. I shall just leave it at that for the, for the time being. Uh, we would also like, uh, those of you who have come today, thank you again so much for coming uh, to, to be part of this special day, to just uh, write something in a book outside at the table in the foyer, and uh, just something that you might want to share, a memory or a tribute. And, um, and I'm sure the emails and other things will keep streaming in over the days and weeks to come. Now, this last part of the service, I've never actually sung this benediction. Uh, Richard asked for this, and so Rob and I, well, Rob's, I'm sure, has, has sung it before. I never have. Chris has. And I know for sure, uh, and I can't believe that we've never sung this in the 17 years I've been here. Uh, I think this used to accompany the evening service pretty much routinely uh, on a, uh, here at Millmead. And um, it's a very fitting way to close uh, our service today. And so what we propose to do... <laughs> is Rob, myself, and thank you again to Chris for joining us today to sing this once through, and then uh, on the second time round, would you please just stand and join us in singing this benediction unto him who is able to keep you from falling.
Father, a special, powerful, real blessing today over Richard and Angie and all their family gathered here today. Above all, may they leave this place with exceeding joy and hope. In Jesus' name we pray. We are going to show again a reel of photos throughout the rest of the afternoon, so please do come back. Can I just say, maybe just keep food and drink out in the foyer, but if you'd like to come back, and there will also be television screens uh, in the foyer for you to enjoy the photos. birthday, February the 14th, and then, um, no, it was the 11th, the 14th, the, 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 her birthday was the 11th, I was home for the, the weekend, and David was um, preaching in the chapel there, and then I, uh, my father was ill, and when I went back to Lincoln, um, I developed the chest uh, trouble that he, uh, that my father had, I got it, it was tracheitis here, I remember writing to mother and saying, I'm not at work today because I've got uh, dad's tracheitis, Fancy being uh, stuck in the house when it's, uh, um, uh, 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 yes, the 14th of February, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> when you can propose, you know, the women are supposed to be able to propose on... Um, but there were members of the church in Gunners who before, had us married before we'd met. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 